Welcome. Spring began last week, and since I know a number of you will be watching this sermon in the beauty of your garden, I thought I would come to you today from the beauty of mine. It is a lovely, warm spring day here in Tulare, and I hope that wherever you are, you are enjoying God's creation in all its glory. Let us begin with prayer. How incredible is your love, O God! We have been made new in your love and reconciled to you and to each other in peace and joy. Be with us this day as we hear your words of comfort and hope. Guide our lives that we may serve you more fully all of our days. Amen. And now let us join together with Landis in song. Mighty is our God. our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, ruler of everything, glory to our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, ruler of everything, His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater, for He has created everything. Oh, oh, oh mighty is our God, mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord. Our God, glory to our King, glory to our Lord, the ruler of everything. His name is higher, higher than any other name. His power is greater, for He has created everything. Mighty is our King, mighty is our Lord, is ruler of everything. Glory to our God, to our God, glory to our God. He is a King, glory to our Lord, ruler of everything, ruler of everything. Prepare to hear the word of God. Join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So last week I talked about the passage from Isaiah where God invites people to come and eat and drink for no money. To come for food and drink that will satisfy their deepest hunger. This week, we're going to talk about a time when that is exactly what God did for the people. Provide food that satisfied their hunger at a time when they couldn't do that for themselves. The central salvation story in the Hebrew scriptures is the story of God bringing Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Without a doubt, the movie The Ten Commandments is going to air on Easter weekend. And if you are like me, you have seen this movie so many times that when you read the story in Exodus, you actually see scenes from the movie in your mind's eye. And Moses always looks just like Charlton Heston. But I confess that I don't remember an important event in that story from the movie. And if I've forgotten, please tell me. That event was the gift of manna. Let's hear the story from Exodus. Exodus 16, verses 2 and 3, and 9 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. 
The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. And Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening quails came up and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there, was, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as the frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Well, it doesn't take long for the Israelites to start complaining. And you can understand their fear. There are a lot of them, and they're in a desert. Where are they going to get food? God hears their concerns and responds by providing. The Israelites wake up one morning, and the ground is covered with this fine, flaky substance. In other places, it's compared to coriander seeds. And the Israelites ask one another, What is it? Did you know that that is what the word manna literally means? What is it? Every time we say something like it's manna from heaven, we're saying, what is it from heaven? Don't tell me that the Bible doesn't have a sense of humor. For all the years that the Israelites spend in the wilderness, they will eat manna. Every morning, it appears on the ground and the people gather it. And they have very specific instructions about what to do when gathering it. They're only to gather enough for one day. If they try to gather more, whatever they save, whatever remains, is rotten the next day. The only exception is the day before the Sabbath. And on that day, they gather enough for two days in order to keep God's commandment to observe the Sabbath. Manna is so important that a jar of it is placed in the Ark of the Covenant along with the stone tablets containing the Ten Commandments. But there comes a time when manna ceases to fall from heaven. Moses has died and Joshua has succeeded him as the Israelites' leader. And the Israelites have arrived at the River Jordan. They've now crossed into the Promised Land. Joshua 5, 10 and 12. While the Israelites were encamped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. God provided for the people's needs as they journeyed. But when the journey ended, it was time for the people to eat the fruit of the land. I wonder what they thought that first morning they woke up and went out to gather the manna and nothing was there. I mean, this whole generation had grown up with manna. They may have grumbled about manna for every meal every day, and they did complain, trust me. But it was all they had known. Now, no manna. Even though God had told them what would happen, I can imagine their confusion, concern, even fear at the disappearance of the manna. They had come to depend on it. What would they do now? Even though the Israelites have heard God's promises and experienced God's care in the wilderness, they must have had doubts and fears as they entered the promised land. You and I know that they will occupy the land, beginning with Jer Jericho, just after this celebration of the Passover. But they don't know that yet. Instead, God asked them to trust him. 
to have faith that God will provide just as God has provided throughout the journey. Maybe in a different way and involving a lot more of their labor. But God is giving them all the resources they will need. They just have to use them. These are still questions for us. Do we trust in the providence of God, that God will provide what we need? Are we willing to work with what God offers, to partner with God to accomplish the work that God gives us? What does the providence of God mean? Well, basically, it is the belief that God will provide what we need, though perhaps not what we want. There's a whole section in our hymnal that is labeled providence, and it talks about how God cares for us. It has some of my favorite hymns in it, too, like Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, with the line, Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Or, God will take care of you through every day or all the way. Or, great is thy faithfulness. With its refrain that reminds us that morning by morning, new mercies we see. And all we have needed, God's hand has provided God's providence is alive and well among us in manna moments, these times of grace when God provides what we need. It can be hard to believe that will happen when we are in the midst of a crisis. We often see God's mercies in hindsight. We find these manna moments when God places blessings in our life in quiet or unexpected ways. The Monday Bible study group saw that in action recently. Now, usually I create my dog Kinsey because she is a live wire who wants everybody to be her best friend. But on this day I left her out and she hopped from one person to the next to greet them and receive their pets. At one point in the discussion, one member shared something deeply personal and painful from their past. Kinsey was sitting beside them and as the story unfolded, she leaned into them, resting her head on them and staring up with these eyes of compassion and love. I actually didn't notice it at the time. Someone else did and, and pointed it out to me. It was a manna moment, a gift of mercy from God providing what was needed. Now, God hasn't rained manna from heaven in a long time, but the manna moments haven't gone away and they often come through God acting through others like God acted through Kinsey. Paul reminds us of this in Ephesians 2. He writes, for we, we are what he has made us created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. In the general rules that John Wesley laid out for the Methodists, he told us to do all the good we can to all the people we can in all the ways we can at all the times we can wherever we can. Many of those times are manna moments. And not just for the people receiving them, but for the people through whom God is working. <clears throat> Bishop Will Willimon recounts one such time from when he was the pastor in a local church. Their church had recruited teams to go throughout the neighborhood, visiting people and inviting them to church. And one team was made up of these two retired teachers, both nearing their 80th birthday. Helen and Gladys were given maps and very careful instructions to turn right at the bottom of the hill. But they were a little hard of hearing and more used to giving directions than taking them. And when they got to the bottom of the hill, they turned left and ended up in the local housing project. Now, they didn't have much success getting, in getting people interested in visiting the church, with one exception, Verlene. Verlene had never been to a church in her life, but she wanted to visit theirs with her two children, and she did the very next Sunday. In fact, Helen and Gladys picked her up with her children to help out. The service made such an impression on Verlene that she decided to come to the Thursday Bible study that week. Willimon was leading the study, and the topic was the temptations of Jesus, and he asked the assembled group, mostly women, if any of them had ever refused temptation because of their faith. One woman recounted how the grocery store had not charged her for a loaf of bread. 
And then she, she thought about going home without pointing that out. But she knew that was wrong, so she spoke up. Everyone nodded approvingly. And then Verlene spoke. A while ago, she said, I was into cocaine bad. And you know what that's like. None of them knew what that was like. It makes you crazy. Me and this guy I was with knocked over a gas station one night, and it was so easy. My boyfriend, he said to me, let's go knock over the convenience store on the corner. But something in me said no. So I told him, I held up that gas station, but I ain't holding up no convenience store. He beat me bad for that. But I still said no. First time I ever said no to anything. Made me feel like I was somebody. <laughs> As you can imagine, there was stunned silence in that room. Finally, Willimon said, said something, anything, to close the session and led them in a prayer. I mean, what could he say to follow Verlaine? As everyone left, Helen came up to him and said, I can't wait to get home and call folks to invite them to next Thursday study. Your Bible studies used to be boring, but I think I can get a good crowd for this. Look at all the manna in that story. Helen and Gladys, who took a wrong turn. God's provenient grace working in Verlene. And Verlene for her honesty and sharing her truth. Helen's recognition of that grace and wanting others to experience it too. Yet there always comes a time when manna ends. That time has come for the Israelites. That doesn't mean God's providence ends. Anthony DeMello, a Jesuit priest from India, is a well-known storyteller. And I thought this one of his stories, of this one of his stories when I read today's passage from Joshua. A man was walking through the forest and he saw a fox that had lost its legs. He wondered how it lived. And then he saw a tiger come along with game in its mouth. The tiger ate his fill and left the rest of the meat for the fox to eat. The next day, the man saw that the fox was fed in the same way. He marveled at God's greatness and declared, I too shall rest in a corner with full trust in the Lord, and he will provide me with all I need. He waited for many days, but nothing happened. He was close to dying of starvation when he heard a voice say, Oh, you who are on the path of error, open your eyes to the truth. Follow the example of the tiger. And stop imitating the disabled fox. It's time for the Israelites to be the tiger rather than the fox. God still provides, but in a different way. There are seasons in our life when we need manna the way the Israelites needed it in the desert. Our survival depends upon it. I look at the refugees fleeing Ukraine and how the people of Poland resp have responded. Churches are opening their doors. People leave strollers they no longer need at the train station for parents who are arriving. We don't expect people fleeing an invading army with not much more than the clothes on their backs to be able to provide for themselves and their families independently. But those times don't last forever. Even the refugees will reach a point where what they need will change. If they return to Ukraine, they will need help rebuilding. If they immigrate to another country, they will build a new life there, just like our ancestors did when they came to America. God knows that our needs change and provides what we need then. Our difficulty is making the transition. We may not think our situation has changed or changed that much. I'm on the conference committee for new and vital congregations and we met this week to approve the budgets for new churches we have started in the last few years. There's a rhythm to the funding. Initially the church planner is he or she, it supports the church planner as she or he gets the enterprise off the ground. In the third year we expect that we will need to increase our support as that new congregation is establishing its roots. But after that the financial support begins to decrease. 
because the new church needs to sustain itself. After five years, we ask, is this a viable body? I imagine that church will experience anxiety as the grants diminish, wondering if they can make it. But if they are doing what God asks, I've found that God will provide, even if we experience some anxious moments. I believe that is true for us, too. Like many churches, Tulare United Methodist Church has experienced changes in the last few years. There are fewer faces in the pews. We have lost members who have died, and it's been hard to reach out to new people because of COVID. Our leadership expected this year to be a challenge, and it is. You who are members of our church will be receiving a letter talking about those challenges. But I firmly believe that God is present and at work here. And if we are following the Spirit's leading, God will provide what we need. I've seen it happen. Now, it may not be what we think we need or even how we want it, but God does provide. God may be asking us to do new or different things like God asked of the Israelites as they moved into the promised land. We may feel uneasy and anxious at the new things God is doing among us and calling us to do. But let us remain faithful as God is faithful. Let us look for the manna moments and ask, how can we be of use to God? And let me close with this from St. Augustine. Trust the past to God's mercy, the present to God's love, and the future to God's providence. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we enter into the stillness of prayer and, and gaze at the day stretching before us, leading us to the glory and hope and promise of new life on Easter Sunday. Our Lenten journey leads us inexorably to the cross, and to the tomb. Refresh us with your manna on our journey. Help us to see the new mercies in our lives each morning as we awaken. Help us to be partners with you in bringing manna moments to others. You have prepared good works for us. Let us give of our gifts as we walk through this season, acknowledging our abilities honestly and sharing them with those who need what we have to offer. And then, O oh God, stretch us to be silent and still and discover new gifts and new ways of sharing. We hear the words of scripture about the Hebrew people who had wandered long in the wilderness. They were fed on the manna which you provided for them until they were able to provide for themselves. Help us to realize that you have given us all that we need to be those who would bring peace and hope to others. Let us place our trust in you so that our sharing is a reflection of your forgiving and reconciling love. And now, Lord, we lift up to you those names of people who are in need of your grace today. Perhaps it's a word of healing or encouragement. Show us how to be your instruments in their lives. And together we pray as Jesus taught us saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, 
Trusting in God's providence is a statement we make every time we give. We're saying that, that we have enough and, and more than enough and that we share with others what God first shared with us. So let us be generous in our giving. Let us pray. God bless what we bring to you now. We trust in your goodness and in your mercy. We know that you will take what we give and bless it, use it to serve others. And we trust that we too will have enough. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now where will we go and who will we be? We go out to be God's people in the world. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit will lead us and guide us, feeding us till we want no more. Amen.